Friday driving. I was by myself, so it's all good. It's great to be uh, with all of you this morning as we uh, just dive into God's Word today. Um, I don't know about you, but I find the Bible really fascinating. How many of you find the Bible fascinating? Okay, good. A whole lot of hands go up. That's a good thing in a church that takes the Bible very seriously. Um, One of the things that I find very fascinating about the Bible is the whole idea of commandments. (laughs) The Bible has a lot of them. Like a lot of these statements, a lot of these teachings that are classified as a command. Now, a command, by definition, is something you are expected to do. If you were in the military and your your sergeant, your, your general, your commander gives you a command, and if you don't do it, you're not going to be part of the squad for very long. There's these commands all throughout the Bible. Now, some of these commands, if we were really honest, are super easy to do, right? I mean, do not murder. I've done pretty good on that one. (laughs) I've yet to break that command. I haven't killed anybody yet. (laughs) Um, And hopefully never will, But that's a really simple command for me to keep. In fact, I don't even pray about that one all that much, right? I don't wake up in the morning going, Lord, make sure I don't kill anybody today. It's not even on my mind that I need God in my life in order to keep living out that commandment. Maybe you feel that way about that command as well too. Maybe there are other commandments in the Bible that you just know in your own strength, in your own capability, you are actually able to keep that command. But then we get other commands, like this one. Be holy, because I am holy. Yeah, see, now when you get into those commands... Those are the type of commands that are easy to just skip over. One, because what does it even mean to be holy? And two, I don't even think I have the capacity to be holy. So when we see a command like be holy, and this is an Old Testament command and a New Testament command. So it's not even like we as followers of Jesus can go, great, we're exempt from this one because that's Old Testament and Jesus fulfills the Old Testament law. No, the apostle Peter reminds the church that the church still lives under the command to be holy because we worship and follow and represent on earth a holy God. So there's two things that we can do with a command like this either ignore it or become extremely legalistic and judge one another to ensure that you are being holy. And I've seen Christians who live that way. I've seen churches that live that way, that we just spend the bulk of our time judging each other's holiness and comparing my holiness compared to your holiness. And how am I doing with this? And we use love language like I speak truth to people to be very cruel to one another. (laughs) To not understand the heart of the command of holiness in the life of the church today. So last week, we, we kicked off a new series where we are looking at the teachings of the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament. This is a prophet who lived hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born. This is a prophet who served many different kings in ancient Israel, some good kings, some bad kings. And the kings just kept getting worse and worse and worse under, king, uh, uh, under the prophet Isaiah, that eventually the Babylonians came in, completely destroyed the state of Israel, completely destroyed the temple, and took the people of Israel into exile that they were completely separated from their way of life. And in the writings of this prophet, we learn a lot about the character and nature of God. And then we jump into the Gospels, 
And we hear Jesus say these words, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Again, in a world and in a culture like we live in today, where so many people feel like God is too big to understand, that I can't fully grasp the character of God, Jesus actually says that's not true. That if you see Jesus, if you look to Jesus, you can understand the Father. We might not always understand his ways. We might not always understand his choices, but we can fully understand his character and his nature just by simply looking at Christ. So that's what we're doing. We're looking at this teaching from Isaiah, looking at the teachings of Jesus and the character of Jesus, to, and then taking it to us as the church. How do we reflect the character and the nature of God in the world that you and I live in today? And so today, we're going to be talking about the characteristic of God's holiness. God's holiness. Now, the concept of God's holiness is a central theme throughout the entire Bible. From beginning to end, we learn that God is holy. What's fascinating about this terminology of God being holy is that biblical scholars don't even have clear agreement on what holy even means. Because holy is so big and is so different than anything that you and I could possibly imagine that we get lost in the definition of it. Like sometimes in order to make such a big concept of holiness to make sense, we'll, we'll say things like, well, it just means to be set apart. Holiness means to be different, to be set apart. Now that's a part of it, but the problem with that is I have, like, I, I'm a nerd and, and I like to paint little soldiers. Well, I have paint brushes that are set apart to only be used on my little plastic soldiers. And if someone goes into my hobby section and uses my paint brushes for something different than what they were set apart for, I get very upset. Like don't use my glue, my special expensive glue to like fix a button on a sweater. It's not for that, it is set apart. Now is my glue and paint brushes holy? No, they're expensive, but they're not holy, <laughs> okay? So it's so much more than simply being set apart. <laughs> There's a vastness to the holiness of God that I think is a challenge for us to grasp. So what I'm going to do today is attempt to just give two ideas of holiness when it comes to God and how God is so holy, give two ideas of God's holiness, and then look at our lives. So if these two things are true about God the Father, true about God the Son, Jesus Christ, and still true as a commandment for the church, how does holiness change us and change how we even do church, change how we live our lives? Okay? So I'm going to start, I'm going to look at the prophet Isaiah. If you want to follow along, I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 6. Um, Isaiah chapter 6 happens very early on in the ministry of the prophet Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter 6, in just four tiny little verses, Isaiah receives a vision of heaven, the throne room of heaven where God in his glory dwells. Now, what's fascinating about the Bible and fascinating about the whole teaching of heaven is throughout the entire Bible, we only have six people who have received a vision of what heaven looks like. There's Isaiah, there was Ezekiel, there was Daniel, there was uh, Peter, there was Paul, and then there was John. <laughs> only six people throughout your entire Bible ever gets a vision about heaven. And it's so incredibly mind-blowing that they don't even know how to describe it. And they use a lot of word pictures to describe, try to write down what they are seeing in this vision. 
And what's fascinating about it is like we as then as modern day Christians, like we just, we, we want to know what heaven is like. We want to know what heaven, pastor, what do you think heaven's going to be like? And the problem is we don't know fully. It's too big for us to grasp. We can't get, and, and the Bible is kind of vague on it. I wish when people say, well, is my puppy going to be in heaven? We just put our dog down this week. As, no, I didn't, but other people. And it's like, is my puppy going to be in heaven? I, I don't know. It, it doesn't say. Like, how is this going to work in heaven? I, I don't know. It, it doesn't say. There's, but one thing is very, very clear about every single vision of heaven is that every single, these, spy, these six men who had a vision of heaven is they were blown away by God's holiness. That is what stood out, is the holiness of God. So let's read Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. And as Isaiah is in this vision of this holiness of God, his only response is, woe to me. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Again, I find passages like this just so amazing because it's so small. It's four little verses talking about just this glory of heaven and the prophet's response of stepping into this vision. The, oh, it, 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 it's a response of, I, I don't belong here. This place is too good. It's too perfect. It's too other. It's too vast. And I am a human being of unclean lips. In other words, everything out of my mouth is no good. I don't belong here. You see, it's interesting when kind of modern day people like to write books that I died and went to heaven. Usually the response of people when they want to sell this type of book is it's like, wow, look how this place was great for me. And look how all these people I love came to meet me. And look how I got everything I wanted. And look how this was good for me. And look how this was good for me. And look how this was good for me. <laughs> uh, but every vision about heaven in your Bible is not about, wow, look how good this is for me. Every vision in your Bible is like, holy smokes, look how great God is. And it's not about me at all. You see, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Again, short little passage. So we talk about people say, well, pastor, what's a seraphim? Great question. I don't know. <laughs> They're only mentioned here. It's the one verse in the entire Bible that mentions a seraphim. Now, I'm a sci-fi guy, so I like to Google seraphim. And I went on to AI art, and I was making seraphim in AI art. And I was going to show one on the screen, but I didn't have time to. It was just nuts. Like, I'm, I'm picturing, like, this vast spiritual being with swords and wings and all of this. Like, we just, we try to get our brain around just the vastness of whatever this supernatural being is. And regardless of how incredibly great that being is, the highest, the highest of the angels, they still cry out and their entire worship 
is centered around the holiness of God. (laughs) That it's his holiness that we worship. (laughs) It's because of God's holiness (laughs) that we bow down. The angels, they cover their eyes. It's almost like even the angels don't deserve to see the glory of God. It's even, and when they cover their feet, it's even like the angels don't deserve to tread and walk where God walks because he is so vast and different than everything else. In four little verses, blows our mind about the vastness of God's glory, the vastness of his holiness, right? And I'm going to pull out shortly a couple of other verses from Isaiah and from Exodus talking about God's holiness and the uh, Israelites' view of holiness. But um, let me jump over to Mark chapter 1 as we look over at the ministry of Jesus. In uh, Mark chapter 1, we read, um, this happens very early on in the ministry of Jesus. Um, Jesus just uh, was baptized Uh, Jesus goes out into the wilderness for 40 days where he's tempted by the devil. He comes out of the wilderness, kind of empowered by the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry. He begins to start calling disciples to follow him. And then in Mark chapter 1, we read this in verse 21. It says, they, so this is uh, Jesus and the uh, just a couple of his disciples, it's Simon and Andrew, who've begun to follow him. So they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and he began to teach. And the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. I always find that fascinating. (laughs) When the men of ancient Israel who were trained up and raised up to teach people the law of God, for some reason, everyone recognizes, yeah, this person... They're speaking out of their ears. <laughs> They're not walking what they teach. <laughs> they know it. They know it. <laughs> you know, they know they're a hypocrite. They know they tell them to do one thing, but they're living another way. They tell them the, the, the religious leader says, be generous, and they just live like rich people and kings. They put a yoke on the people of Israel that they themselves don't even carry. <laughs> with the commands of God. The people know it. So you listen to that kind of teaching and you go, there's no authority there. It doesn't come with anything. It goes, and then it continues. So Jesus is teaching one who has authority. His life models what he's teaching. And verse 23 continues, and just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority, and he even even gives orders to the impure spirits, and they obey him. And news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Right, so here, again, early on in his ministry, Jesus is confronting this impure spirit that's in the synagogue. Now, your translation might say unclean, an unclean spirit. And I find that language, again, just as a Bible nerd, I find that fascinating because Mark's gospel is written to Jewish people to help them understand Jesus as the Messiah. So by calling the spirit unclean, like being unclean is a really big deal to Jewish people (laughs) because their entire religious system is built around being clean, spiritually clean so you can go and worship God. And this spirit is unclean. It's impure. In other words, that type of spirit has a way of impacting your worship of God that you can't because you're unclean and impure, which is the exact opposite of the spirit of God. 
where the Holy Spirit comes on us as his followers and makes us clean and makes us pure permanently for eternity, <laughs> right? And so you got this unclean, this impure spirit who sees Jesus teaching with his authority. And even though the people don't know fully who Jesus is, <laughs> the spiritual realm does. <laughs> And the spiritual realm sees Jesus teaching and declares him to be the Holy One of God. The same Holy One seated on the throne in Isaiah chapter 6. We actually read, if you fast forward to Isaiah chapter 41, the Holy One of God is the title that Isaiah gives to the coming Messiah. And the Spirit spiritual realm knows who he is. And he's like, you've come to destroy us. That we can't even stand against your holiness. See, holiness of God, holiness of Jesus, we see visions of it, we see evidence of it as the spiritual realm interacts with it. And then the challenge for us, I believe, as the church, is going, what do we do with the holiness of God? See, as we explained last week in this series, the challenge, I believe, for us as followers of Jesus is the truth of the matter that, the, the, the truth, the, 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 I'll get my word, you were created in the image and likeness of God. That's what the Bible teaches. And I've said this before, and I will say this to the day I die. I do not believe you are an accident. I do not believe you evolved from scum. I do not believe some lightning bolt hit a pool of ooze and you are here now. It's not what I believe. You were created by a loving, holy God. And you were created in his image and likeness. We are image bearers of God. So God's holiness is in humanity. But, as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, is there, there's this thing called sin that it's not just a bad attitude, it's not just a doing something wrong or I didn't do what I should do. Sin is a disease that has completely engulfed us and has completely messed us up, body, soul, and spirit. So much so, we don't even recognize it sometimes, the brokenness of humanity because of sin. So there's this call of holiness to the church as image bearers of God, but we're still dealing with the fact that you and I are broken images of God in the world. You know, I love this verse here in uh, 1 Peter, where 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 says this, as obedient children, so he's talking to people who've put their faith in Jesus. You turn to Jesus to save you from your sin. You are a child of God. So he's not talking to non-Christians out there. He's talking to the church. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So this is this idea before you were a Christian, before you gave your life to Christ, before you turned your heart from sin and turned your heart back to God, before you repented, you lived in ignorance. You didn't know. Like I can actually look back because I came to Christ in my late 20s. I know my ignorance. I know the way I was living. I remember it well. I just didn't know. I was living like the way the world lives. And everyone else around me was living this way. And so that's just how humans live. You know, we don't go around blaming one another for this. It's like it's how we grew up in the culture that we find ourselves in. But then suddenly when the Spirit comes into us and he begins to correct and to counsel and to rebuke, <laughs> and to transform, suddenly there's this teaching here that, well, these evil desires that you used to have when you were living in ignorance don't conform to those anymore. 
Why? Because just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. Because it is written, be holy because I am holy. So the big idea, as we're going to unpack holiness a little bit. So the big idea that I want to encourage you with, and you might want to write this down, talk about it in your life group this week, is this. Is this idea that God calls the church to reflect his holiness by living set apart, righteous lives devoted to him. God calls the church to reflect his holiness by living set apart, righteous lives devoted to him. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we got to become these legalistic, angry, crusty people again? No. (laughs) But it means we need to maybe look a little different than what culture looks like. That we need to look and live a little different than what the world looks like and how the world lives. So again, I want to look at two things about God's holiness, and then I'm going to try to bring it home and how you and I live out our call to holiness. So the first idea that we, we, we learn about God's holiness from Isaiah and from the life of Jesus is this idea of God's moral perfection. God's moral perfection, right? Part of holiness means that God is perfectly pure without sin, right? This is one of the key things about God. This is one of the key things about Jesus is that he's completely totally free from sin, the influence of sin. His decisions are completely done from a moral perfection, right? His actions, his nature, his character are flawless. He's completely separated from any, any, any form of moral imperfection, right? We read this in Exodus chapter 15, verse 11 where it says, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic and in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You see, when you, when you study uh, the ancient Middle East, or if you study you know, Greek or Roman gods, any of these studies, I mean, I was... Uh, Again, back when I was in college, I loved Indiana Jones and I loved archaeology and all that kind of stuff. And I took courses on on Roman gods and Greek gods and Middle Eastern gods because it was just cool to study this stuff. I thought it was cool. The girls in college didn't think it was cool, but I thought it was cool. And uh, But you study this stuff and you realize the gods of all of these cultures are not nice at all. Like, humanity is nothing but playthings to the gods. It's like there's this giant cosmic chessboard, and you and I are being moved along this board for the sheer enjoyment of some god who wants to see you get smited for just the pleasure of watching you burn. And humanity worship these gods out of fear and trepidation (laughs) that they'll be used as a pawn on this cosmic chessboard. And humanity is fighting to move from a pawn position. Well, maybe I could be a rook (laughs) or a knight, or a bishop or or the king or queen. (laughs) But the gods just throw us away. They're mean. They're cruel. They lie. They manipulate. (laughs) They war against each other for power and prestige. And Moses comes along and says, who's like you, O Lord? Because the creator of heaven and earth is radically different. Radically different than anything that humanity has ever known about God before. That's where unapologetically when people, non-Christians, people wrestling with things of faith, when they tell me Christians and Jews and Arabs and Muslims, we're all the same, we all worship the same God. And I unapologetically say, no, no, not even close. It's not even close to being the same God. I think sometimes just people just want it to be the same God so they don't have to actually look at the evidence of it. But the God of the Bible 
is radically different, that he's majestic in his holiness. He is awesome in all of his glorious deeds. He does wonder upon wonder upon wonder, right? That his holiness is beyond comparison to any other being. You can't even compare him to any other teaching of any other God. You can't even compare him to the seraphims and the cherubims and all the other spiritual things that we read about in the Bible. <laughs> that his moral perfection is so much greater than all of those. Right? right? And then when we read about Jesus, that Jesus actually reflects that moral perfection as well. Right? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we, we read this about Jesus where it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Jesus reflects the perfect moral character of God. That he lived a human life, was tempted in every single way that you and I are tempted, that he faced the exact same challenges in family, in work, in community, in church, that you and I face every day. And his moral perfection never gave up. That he was without sin, completely and totally. Right? That's holiness is a level of moral perfection that I think our human brains go, what? Because it's so vast. Which leads into the next point about what holiness means and represents. It's this idea of God's transcendence. God's transcendence. Transcendence is a fancy theological word, which basically means otherness. That, that God is so significantly, significantly different than his creation, that, that he's unique, that he's set apart, that he's transcendent above all things in power, in nature, in existence, that there is nothing else like God. <laughs> Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 give us that picture of God's transcendence, of God's otherness, where God himself declares this. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. God doesn't think like human beings. Neither are your ways my ways. <laughs> Humanity's ways to get things done is not the way God gets things done, right? My thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways, declare the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. <laughs> it's completely different. I mean, last week we talked about justice and, and there's a deep desire in so many of us that we desperately want justice, especially if we've been wronged. And we go, when am I going to get my justice? <laughs> well... The Bible doesn't say you're ever going to get it. <laughs> because our, in our humanness, our ways is to get justice. <laughs> and God's going, yeah, it's not my way. <laughs> I'm completely different. <laughs> I'm completely unique. <laughs> not like the way humans think about all of these things. Right? Is that God's transcendence, his holiness makes him completely and totally unique, right? And, and again, and we see that modeled out into the ministry of Jesus. Like when we read in Mark chapter one, why does Jesus have this authority that no other religious leader around there has? Now, I think sometimes we as, you know, modern day Christians, we give the religious leaders of Jesus's day a bad rap, <laughs> You know, and we mock the Pharisees and we mock the Pharisees. Oh, how stupid they are. If I was there, I would have followed Jesus. No, you wouldn't have. I probably wouldn't have. Most didn't. But some did. Some did. They knew who he was, the Holy One of God. 
and they followed him, okay? But even them still didn't have the same authority that Jesus had. Why? Because he's completely unique. Because <laughs> he's a completely different teacher. <laughs> that he's shown up with a completely different power. <laughs> that he's God in flesh, <laughs> walking among humanity. <laughs> right? So we see God's moral perfection. We see God's transcendence as being a part of his holiness. And remember, the big idea is God calls the church to reflect his holiness. <laughs> by being set apart, by, be, by living righteous lives devoted to him. And so the challenge, I think, for us is go, what do we do with the concept of moral perfection and oneness of transcendence in the church? Does it still have a place today? Well, hopefully you know the answer is yes, but the challenge is, is how? How does God's moral perfection and God's uniqueness, his holiness, still play out in the lives of the church. Because again, this isn't an Old Testament teaching. This is a New Testament commandment. Be holy. Because I will smite you if you're not. Be holy, or the other people in your church will judge you harshly. Be holy or you won't be welcomed here. It's not what he says. It's be holy. Because our God, whose image we bear, is holy. Right? And I think the challenge for us is understanding how God works in our lives in the topic of moral perfection and transcendence or uniqueness of, of otherness in the life of the church. And you can see this play out if, if you read um, different Christian literature. If, if you just, like you can read about this even in the newspaper because it's big news today where we see more and more and more Christian denominations splitting and fighting over the morality of today's culture. Where more and more and more churches are embracing the morality of today's culture. And then they take the morality of today's culture, and then they take the Bible, and they try to then make the Bible show that today's culture is right. And that everyone should move towards culture's morality. The challenge for that as the church is if you find yourself having to force a Bible verse into a moral opinion, <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. The Bible's actually super clear. There, there's not a lot of big mystery about God's morality. He, he's quite clear on the topic of how he views sin, how he views money, how he views sexuality, how he views women, how he views people of different ethnic groups, how he views justice, all of these different things. God's quite clear. It gets muddy when you and I as human beings don't like God's morality and we want our own. And the only thing that can help us with that is to come before this holy God and say, heal me. change me. I don't like the fact that God has a certain view about sexuality, but it's God's moral view about sexuality. So God, instead of me trying to change you, which is a losing battle, just so you know, um, how about we approach God and saying, God, heal me. I love in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, right, where it says, being confident, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This day of Christ Jesus is when Jesus returns again. <laughs> and that God will continue working on us. <laughs> and sometimes we move <laughs> into God's you know, moral perfection more and more. It's a journey. <laughs> 
sometimes we backslide and get a little mucky in the world's view of morality, but God's not done. Even in these churches that I see and it breaks my heart and I weep over them that choose to follow the teachings of the world instead of the teachings of the Bible. And it'd be easy to just, oh, that stupid church and those stupid leaders and that stupid pastor. No, God's not done with them yet. God heal them. God change them. Help them to not be afraid of what people think. God help me to not be afraid of what people think. And it's a challenge. We live in a challenging day. I remember several years ago, we did a sermon series called uh, How to Love Your LGBTQ Plus Neighbor. And I talked about transgenderism openly on a Sunday morning. And this was years ago. This was long before today's issue with this topic. And I had people who I know who are transgendered watch the sermon online. (laughs) And there was a little part of me going, turn it off. (laughs) Don't put that sermon online. If you put that sermon online, what do we do? (laughs) Target. (laughs) But it was like, but as I prayed about it, God goes, who are you more afraid of? (laughs) Them or me? (sighs) I went to the tech team and I said, keep it online. Don't delete it. And then my transgendered people who I know who are in my life thanked me for my message. They did not agree with it, but they thanked the heart that we had on the topic to address it. (laughs) See, And that only comes by knowing that God is going to continue to work in us. (laughs) That God calls the church to follow his moral perfection. It does not mean that the church's moral uh, morality is going to be perfect. <laughs> not saying that at all. But we still submit to God's moral perfection to see it come out more and more in the life of the church. Right? And the same is true for God's transcendence, for God's otherness. We have to trust that God is still working in our lives with that as well. You see, you are supposed to look different than your non-Christian friends and your non-Christian families. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you got to be the weird Bible thumper or the person who protests everything or anything like that. I'm not saying that. But there should be an otherness about you. Like if you go and work in the business world, if you're a salesperson, how you do sales should be a little different. There should be an otherness to you. If you're in politics, and this is, I, gonna, I keep saying I'm going to do a whole sermon series on politics. Christians, there should be an otherness to us. We don't play the game just because it's the game. There's an otherness to us that should look different than everybody else. As a stay-at-home parent, as a high school student, there's an otherness to us. But it's so easy to conform into the world. Whether out of fear, whether out of not wanting to look overly religious or legalistic. But we have to approach again, we read, as we read in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, we have to believe that God will bring healing into our lives that he will continue a good work in us. That in my business, in how I raise my family, in my politics, in whatever it is for us, that God is building me into his transcendence to reflect his otherness. Yeah, we always talk about this as leaders here. We talk about the Church of Canada. We're not supposed to look Canadian. Just like if you're from Africa, you're not supposed to look African. If you're from the Middle East, you're not supposed to look Middle Eastern. So often we we excuse ourselves because of our culture. (laughs) Oh, this is just Canadian culture. Oh, this is just African culture. Oh, this is just Middle Eastern culture. No, we're supposed to be Christian. (laughs) We're supposed to have Jesus culture. (laughs) Okay? Oh, well, you know, I'm always late because that's my culture. No! (laughs) No! Let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. (laughs) 
You know, it's like, well, you know, all these things, we're, we're countercultural, we have a, a uniqueness to us. That's the challenge for holiness. It doesn't mean we're always going to get it right, but we have to pursue it. We'll stumble over one another as we wrestle with holiness. But again, just like justice last week, I firmly believe there is a desperate need for the church to reflect God's holiness. Because if we're just reflecting the moral purity of the, uh, the or the moral, um, the morality of the world, if we're just, if we look exactly like the world, what do we actually have to offer? Nothing. <laughs> there are better things to do on a Sunday morning than me get up here and teach you the world's morality. <laughs> or to point you to a God who's no different than any other God. <laughs> but we come together and we worship in the name of Jesus because he is morally perfect, that he is completely unique, that he is the God above every other God, that he is the name above every other name, and that he is the only one who truly deals with humanity's sin. Not because we are so religious, but because he is so perfect and so holy, that he would be willing to die in our place to pay for our sin, and that we are made completely pure, free from the influence of any impure spirit because of his holiness. And we get that by simply saying, Father, forgive me. Heal my heart clean my soul, touch my body, and use me for your glory. See, when we pray that way, whether that's your first time ever praying it or you prayed it a thousand times, that's how God works. And step by step by step, his holiness is shown everywhere that we go. Let's pray. Father, like the angels in Isaiah's vision, we cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That we come to this space in person and online, not in any other name, <laughs> not in the name of Greenbelt, not in the name of Pastor Kevin, not in the name of any programs that we run, but we come in the name that is holy. And we come in the name that saves us from our sins. And we come in the name that frees us from the impure spirits of the world. And we come in the name who builds us up in his holiness. And so, Lord, as we continue to worship, I pray for all of us that maybe there are parts of our lives and we've been wrestling with this idea that we know that you want to change parts of us and we've been fighting against you. Father God, I pray that even today we would submit, that you would continue a good work in us <laughs> to draw us closer into your moral perfection and into your uniqueness. <laughs> and a little bit more of your holiness would be shown to the people around us even today. <laughs> Father, I pray for the church of Jesus Christ all throughout the city and all throughout our nation, and I pray that the church would be known as people who are holy. <laughs> Not in a self-righteous, religious way, but in a humble, loving way that shows the world that you're different. That shows the world how much they need you. So Lord, as we continue to worship, continue to speak to you.